So you've probably heard the term, the wrong side of the tracks. If you haven't, it's basically a phrase that means the bad part of town. If someone is from the wrong side of the tracks, it means that they had a deprived upbringing, maybe they're a bit dodgy. Context is everything, as I recently explained to my defence counsel. Okay, but what does it really mean? Where does the phrase come from? Well, as a railway YouTuber and someone with a bit of an interest in language on the side, I thought I'd do a little video to talk about it. The phrase is an Americanism dating from the early 20th century. This was a time when cities and the country as a whole were growing up. Like many idioms, it's probably a little older than that, but the point stands. A railway, like any industrial infrastructure was a bit of a nimby thing. You didn't really want to live next to it. While railways can bring people together, they can also divide. Wherever you get a barrier, be it rail, road, river, or whatever, you're going to create the potential for division. Maybe one side is poorer than another, maybe it's better policed, maybe it has better public facilities, whatever. In some countries, like Britain, the railways are usually fenced off for safety, so you can only get across by the occasional footbridge, level crossing, or underpass. What determines which side is the wrong side? Well, here we're going to have to go all the way back to the 1840s and Britain's railway mania. This was an era when, as the name suggests, Britain went nuts over railways. The government had a very laissez-faire attitude, which made it very easy to get a railway authorised and for the promoters to fleece their investors for all they were worth. And then some. All you had to do was convince Parliament that your scheme was plausible, and you could get approval. Note that the definition of plausible was very broad. You didn't have to provide engineering specifications or any evidence that you actually knew how to build a railway. While many schemes flopped, as you might expect, Britain wound up with a disproportionate amount of track mileage by the end of the 19th century. So that's the background. Britain had a lot of tracks to be on the wrong side of. In order to build those tracks, railways were given powers of compulsory purchase over the land they wanted to build across. The landowners could object, but the railways were big companies with a lot of money, so many small landowners just couldn't afford the legal wrangling. Incidentally, this is a big reason why the railway map of central London looks the way it does. Pretty much all the land was owned by people wealthy enough to fight. Railways either avoided the centre of town or routed their lines over land owned by as few people as possible, to make financial settlement easier. But railways didn't just buy the land they needed. Building a railway is a complex process. There may be unforeseen issues that require the line to take a slightly different route or to add infrastructure that they didn't think they'd need when they first planned it. You know that bit in Blazing Saddles where they run into the quicksands? That kind of thing. Man, I love that film. So railways would acquire extra land to accommodate any changes. The excess land was known as the limit of deviation. When railways had finished building, they had to sell the excess land. Well, except for the Metropolitan Railway, but that's a whole other video. The point is that the land they had to sell was kind of crummy. It was next to a busy railway, and it was usually an awkward shape and size, not really suitable for residential development, nor for large industries that could bring employment. It would often find itself turned over to small industries or good old-fashioned waste ground. Nobody wants that, so the houses nearby would go down in value. In cities, which were of course very desirable places for railway companies, some neighbourhoods would have several lines. Parts of town might be effectively fenced off by railways on two or more sides. For the poorer inhabitants, moving away wasn't an option. Often they relied on being in one particular place for work, so they would be crowded into ever more cramped conditions, creating slums. Once again, the government of the mid-19th century had little interest in what happened to poor people. In fact, some railway promoters even promised that the railway would get rid of the poor. The promoters of Birmingham New Street sold it on the basis that it would, and I quote, "...remove a certain class of the inhabitants living just behind the principal and best streets." Of course, it didn't always work that way, but this gives you some idea of the prevailing attitude. 
I confess that I've deviated beyond the limits of the original title of this video. We've gone from talking about an American idiom to the socio-economic factors of railway development in Britain. But I hope I've given you some insight into how a person might find themselves on the wrong side of the tracks. Well, I hope you enjoyed this deviant video. If so, then please do leave a like and subscribe for more. This video really was a bit of an impulsive thing. I was reading up on railway development in Victorian cities and I came across the stuff about limit of deviation. And I just thought it might make an interesting video. So, here we are. Thanks, as always, to my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon. You are the ones who remove the limits to my deviation. That sounded wrong. Anyway, I will see you all again very soon. Cheerio!